Um, so welcome all to this 10th ISEM web colloquium. And it is a pleasure to have Professor Toshiyuki Ajuma uh, from Riken, Japan today as our colloquium speaker. And I would like to request Professor Lokesh Trivedi to introduce the speaker and start the proceedings. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. <clears throat> and Aditya and Safwan, thank you for asking me to introduce uh, Azuma-san. And Azuma-san, arigato gozaimasu. Thank you for agreeing and dhanyawad for giving this, uh, agreeing to give this talk to our society, Atomic Physics Society of India. And uh, of course, Azuma-san, to introduce, there are two things. I have to say one thing, of course, about his physics and science, as of course it is written in the very nicely written uh, what circulated by Aditya, that he started, he did his PhD from Tokyo, okay, University of Tokyo, and then uh, he was, he spent some time in Tsukuba University, and of course I know him from the days when he was in Tokyo Metropolitan University, and now after all this he is in Riken, and uh, as a chief scientist of Riken, so it is always nice to <clears throat> introduce Azuma-san. Personally, of course, we are very good friends for many, many, many years. Right. And uh, Azuma-san is an uh, Indian lover, basically. He loves India. He loves Indian food. He loves to visit India at any time. And many times our conferences, if there is a possibility, he always comes here to talk to us and give lectures and so on. So first time I, mm, uh, I uh, remembered again physics related, I met him 22 years back, the Bensheim conference of highly charged ions when Azuma-san was giving a talk on channeling and wake field and solid state uh, effects and so on, so on, many things. And we found that there are a lot of commonality among us. And since our interaction started, uh, Azuma-san visited TIFR, I think next year itself. And then we had a lot of discussions and uh, my gateway to Japan was through Azuma-san and Gateway of Japan University was Tokyo Metropolitan University. So since then we have many, many interactions and I am glad to see that that interaction has gone to the next generation. Our students and their students have a lot of good contacts with Azuma-san. Azuma-san is mostly well known for his channeling experiment, you know, crystal channeling. He will explain all this, I'm sure, in a very, very nice technique in which atomic collisions are studied even in channeling conditions which is not an easy experiment. And very few groups in the world, they mustered about that many years back. For example, very well-known group was uh, an uh, Arhus, and of course in uh, Das group and uh, Oak Ridge, uh, and then other uh, two, three groups, of course in Japan. And uh, our own group was earlier in uh, very much interested and used to do a lot of channeling experiment here in TIFR. And that's all I remember four or five names. Now, the channeling, of course, there's a French group uh, at Lyon. So now there are basically, I see most active group are these two. One is Azuma-san's group and uh, Lyon. And Azuma's group went ahead and really did a lot of fascinating and very forefront experimental work on crystal channeling technique and do RCE, resonant coherent and excitation. And I personally had a lot of chance to visit certain experiments at uh, Chiba, where he used to do very high energy accelerator at HIMAC. And he does those experiments mostly there. But he's not limited to crystal channeling and RC because he has taken it a completely new direction, this experiment. The whole growth is centered around this Tokyo group. Apart from the Leo group, they are also involved in this experiment. And now they have joined hand and do experiments at Spark GSI, uh, these experiments. And he has a lot of contact with the Russian theorists on these works. And I think he got very fascinating results on this RC experiments. But apart from that, as the, his write-up says, he has been involved with electrons, muon work, and also of late uh, storage ring based uh, atomic collision works at much lower energy and heavy ion storage ring. One they had initiated at, uh, of course, earlier at Tokyo Metropolitan University. And uh, there are, uh, they had uh, the EBs or EB machine there, we have a, and then now he has initiated a new machine at Riken, which has been working for now many years. And uh, so Azuma-san as a personal front is not only wonderful physicist, it's a very, very nice human being to interact, to work, to go for places. 
and you learn a lot of Japanese culture, food, you cannot, um, you cannot miss him. I mean, basically, you cannot avoid to miss him if you are there in Japan, Tokyo, or any international conferences, and including uh, our personal interactions, including his home. We have gone many places in Japan together. We had many interactions, and I think many of you know he's a wonderful physicist, but at the same time, very, very nice human being and extremely hardworking physicist. So, um, Azuma has been uh, ICPI chairperson. Many of you know Lenzhou uh, conference ICPI 2013. He was the chairperson, and since then he was also an IUPOP uh, vice president and so on. So um, I think this is enough of introduction, Azuma san. I think I can go on saying for hours, but we don't have time more than five minutes. So Azuma san, please go ahead and uh, uh, start your talk. And thank you very much for coming to our community and giving the talk. Okay, thank you very much for very nice introduction. More than 10 minutes, I think. <laughs> you talk everything. But by the way, do you hear me? Everybody can hear me? It's okay? Yes, yes. No yes. Okay. Then I will start. Okay, so today's talk, my title is a little bit too ambitious. What are the basic principles that unite the various atomic and molecular processes? But anyways, I will do my best. Maybe either I can use almost one hour or 40 minutes, 15 minutes. Maybe that's enough to explain what I want to say today. Okay, let's start. Oh, okay. So this is the organization of my talk today. It, okay, maybe I will spend 10 minutes about the self-introduction and about what's going on at the weekend. And after that, I want to provide a lecture to you. A little bit boring, but uh, no more than 10 minutes or 20 minutes. But that's really important to understand what I want to transfer today. Then after that, originally I prepared uh, two topics about atomic excitation and uh, molecular excitation. But uh, maybe I concluded that to concentrate only the atomic excitation using the, yes, the high energy channeling technique is more passionating to you to understand what I want to transfer today. Then finally, the conclusion. Okay, so let's start. <clears throat> I believe I always use this slide. Our atomic physics or mole atomic molecular optical physics is really the sit in the center of the all of other science. It's really connected to the solid state physics, physical chemistries, or astrophysics or fundamental physics and blah, blah, blah. And I want to show some <clears throat> examples. For instance, you know, we Japanese has an X-ray satellite. Using this X-ray satellite, they are observing the X-ray from the highly charged ions to discuss about the uh, galaxy. But indeed, what they are observing is really highly charged ion X-ray line. It's atomic physics, I should say. Then another colleague, she's using the brand new observatory ARMA. Then she's Dis discussing about uh, at the timing of the formation of the star. But in reality, what she's observing is a rotational spectra of molecules. That's again AMO physics, I'm sure. Then the other colleagues, like uh, Stefan Wilmer, he's an anti proton guy using the penning ion trap. And he's measuring the magnetic moment extremely very precisely. That's again atomic physics, fundamental atomic physics, I'm sure. Then in our societies, yes, for, for the last 10 years or 20 years, we got many, many new tools like ion storage ring, ion traps, or sometimes optical traps. Then also, of course, we have a new photon source like intense ultra short pulse lasers or sometimes XFEL. 
that's our societies. However, <clears throat> today I want to emphasize that my or our direction of research is I love, of course, very new thing, very new one. But uh, more than that, I love very exotic or very peculiar phenomena. But it should be fundamental and very universal. In addition, I love very simple and beautiful physics. Okay? That's easy to say such that, but uh, what I'm really involved in is I'm now, right now, I'm involved in many topics as Rokesh introduced. Now I'm heavily involved in the IO storage ring, storing the molecular ions, and I'm, we are discussing about the de excitation dynamics. But related with these topics, already maybe in the previous seminars, Oday from the Weizmann Institute explained a lot, I think. So he's uh, really the competitor to us. <clears throat> Then next topic is, uh, as Rokesh introduced me, is I'm involved in this uh, channeling or non-channeling uh, excitation process for long and uh, for long, long years. And again, today I want to uh, explain uh, this phenomena very carefully and very in detail. And uh, very recently, I also involved in uh, dealing with the uh, positively negative ions, or sometimes muonic atoms to check the QED, or discussing about the three-body problems. That's my very recent new topics I'm heavily involved in. Okay. <clears throat> Anyways, <clears throat> let's start with my self-introduction. <clears throat> I was born in 1960. That means now I'm just two, several days before I became 60. <clears throat> but originally, I graduated from the Department of the Nuclear Engineering. Then I, even there, I studied radiation chemistries. So originally, I was a chemist. But the strange chemist, I'm studying with the positrons. And at the doctor course, I majored in neuron physics even at the postdoc days. Then returning back to Japan, I studied atomic collision or radiation physics and blah, blah, blah. And still I'm involved in this field. And this is a picture when I was 29 years old, very young. So at that time, I was enjoying Muon spin resonance, okay? The muon spin resonance is very similar to the electron spin resonance or nuclear resonance. Muon has a spin, then just applying the magnetic field due to the Zeeman effect, level splitting broadened, then applying RF field to flip spin of the muons. <clears throat> but my case, <clears throat> we, we are dealing with uh, not only muon spin, but uh, interaction with uh, muon spin with electron and proton. Then this is a typical cases of the several, several <clears throat> potential energy curves crossing each other. At that point, level crossing takes place or I should say avoided the level crossing. That's a very general physical concept to understand the phenomena. Then using this technique, I measured resonance of the radical, so chemical species. The name of chemical species is cyclohexadienyl radical. So now I almost forget the structure of this chemical species. However, to me, the important thing is uh, just we are discussing about the interaction of these three particles, muons, proton, and the electron. And from these interactions, we can discuss about the diffusion rate 
of this radical on the surfaces. So I love pure quantum state, but in complicated media. That's my starting point and still maybe the same direction. Okay, then after 30 years, what's happened? That's what I want to explain today. But before that, I will talk about the basic quantum physics <clears throat> for 10 minutes. Yes, everybody knows <laughs> initial state Hamiltonians and eigenstate vectors is written by 1001. Yes, then if there's a perturbation, it's really some of the perturbation is written in this way. Then solution of the wave function is written in phi plus and phi minus in this way. Yes. Then we get avoided level uh, avoided level closings. So the state were divided into upper state and the lower state. And this avoided level crossing is uh, very general, I should say. For instance, for the chemist, this benzene structure is very well known to be stable, but it's considered to be the mixture or superposition of the left side structures and right side structures. Because of the such superposition, stabilization take place from the viewpoint of the avoided level cross crossing. That's one way to see these structures. But from such sense, even a, such molecular structures, H2 plus, so two proton plus one electron, that's really bound state, you know very well. And you know the wave function of the, this molecule. However, this one also considered as a uh, superposition of the left side structures and right side structures. And you turning back to the basic of basic. <clears throat> when you know the eigenfunctions, the total wave function is uh, written by the sum of eigenfunctions with the term of the time dependent term showing the phase, yes. Then solving these equations, we can get these pictures. This is famous Rabi oscillations. So sometimes state sit in a lower state and sometimes sit in a higher state, but it's flipped between these state forever if coherency is perfect. That's what the quantum mechanics says. Okay? Then, <clears throat> this is uh, one of my teachers, Hiroki Nakamura. He's a theoretical chemist. And he says, non adiabatic transition, about the non adiabatic transition, he says, everything is changing all the time and nothing is permanent, or it's, it's just like uh, Indian philosophies. And the origin of the mutability of the world is non-diabetic transition. Of course, there's variety of phenomena explained by non-adiabatic transition. Atomic and uh, molecular collision, of course, but uh, photo dissociation or photoisomerization, or simply the chemical reaction also. Then it's related with uh, solid state physics and even uh, electron transfer or proton transfer in bio molecules. And let's go back to this equation again. So it's really the same. Then if we think about the, the origin of the interaction photons, as you know it very well, Electric field is quantized using the harmonic oscillator like this. Then this is a 
operator of the vector potential. Then, if we consider two level atom, lower and upper state, and only one mode photon, that's very simple, simplest version. Then it is called Jane's Cummings model. Then using this model, again, we can describe about the interaction between an atom and a photon. Then of course, in this case, photon is written by the ladder operators going up and going down. And finally, Hamiltonian is explained, expressed in the sum of the three terms pointed out the red zone. Then inserting, then by solving these equation and blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> Again, Rabi splitting is defined and Rabi frequency is defined. And we have these pictures again. This is a typical picture of the avoided level crossing. So always we have such impressive behavior of the state energy change under the avoided level cross crossing. That's the main topic of my talk today. And of course, this is the origin of the dipole force. It's really the key point for the optical traps. And even, okay, just, <clears throat> I won't say, even the neutrino oscillations. Now in Japan, many people are uh, involved in this neutrino oscillation business <clears throat> because it's a Nobel Prize well, gone, uh, was gone to the one, one of the Japanese researchers. But uh, quite often I ask the student, yes, you know, neutrino oscillation, but why it oscillates? I will ask to the student. It's really some os such oscillation is observed as a function of the distance of the neutrino flying. Why? It's, it's again the same physics, I should say. When neutrino is produced, it's really the, under the weak interaction field. It's really the produced in the eigenstate of the flavors. However, it's jumped into the vacuum. Now, no more weak interaction. And it's expressed by the eigenstate of the mass then this flavor's eigenstate is expressed by the quantum mechanical superposition of the eigenstate of the mass. We should say it's coherent. It's very common for us. And this is written in Japanese. However, all of the equation is the same as I explained already. Exactly the same. Then, Again, I will show this Schrodinger equation again, and uh, I will explain some example about the static state. When, as a perturbation, electric field is applied, wave function is written in this way. It's really moderated time dependent uh, wave functions. Then, <clears throat> already in 90s, 76, quantum beat is observed, but in this case, this oscillation is as a function of the flight length. Yes, that's again flight length, but uh, it's for the H atom staying in 2 state. When they are entering into the constant electric field, they their state is oscillate between 2s and 2p state because it's really again written as a superposition of the two state. Okay, so it's really the superposition of electronic excited state. But not only that, this case is a superposition of the fine structures. 
This is very simple experiment, already done at 1974. Please consider fast ions traveling through the thin foil, just, just like that. But uh, because of the fa because of the ion is traveling so fast, and because the thin foil is so thin, excitation energy is when the excitation energy is smaller than the energy width due to the limited time to define the excitation. It's really defined by the uncertainty principle. So it's if interaction is too short, all of the state are excited coherently. Then we have fine structure again like that. Not only that, even the hyper fine structures it's really written as a superposition of the state and we can observe the quantum state, the uh, quantum beat. It's found by Sergio Alosh, he's a Nobel winners, Nobel Prize winners because of the other reasons, but in his younger days, he succeeded in such experiment. Then nowadays, such quantum beat is very, very common and popular in ultra-fast chemistries. Sometimes we should say the interference of the wave packet, but anyways, because of such a super uh, superposition, we can learn about the structure of the molecule and blah, blah. Okay, that's my very short lectures. And such concepts, I will explain how it's very involved in my business. Okay, then <clears throat> let's start with resonant coherent excitation using the highly charged ions and the crystal. So in this case, my ion is uh, extremely high energy ions, more than 10 GeV, and usually hydrogen-like or helium-like, something like that passing through the silicon crystal. That's all. <clears throat> and uh, during my talk today, I want to emphasize another aspect, especially to younger students or younger persons, to succeed to observe good physics, you should meet person with very specialized skill. That's very important. And also I want to emphasize, you should meet a person with very fresh mind. Fresh mind means uh, not so familiar with the very specialized topics or physics field. So I should say younger student. Then three, person with the knowledge of the different field. So if we always discussing among the common societies like atomic collisions, it's not so easy to introduce the new concept, but just by adding the newcomers from the different field, then we will find a new idea. So that's three. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, let's start with always, I always start with this slide. So now you have many good X-ray photon source, like high harmonic generation using the lasers or X-ray FL. But my case is always I use this tiny thin silicon crystal. It's very thin, one micron thick. So you, it's very transparent. And this is my first comment. I met Dr. Shibali, he belonged to the office in Denmark, actually he's French, but in this world, in this world, only he can provide this ultra thin silicon crystal. So without him, I could not go forward. But one of my successes, I could meet him, I could meet him and he kindly provided us a thin silicon crystal. So that's specialist. 
in target synthesis. Then another good news for us, maybe 20 years before in Japan, so newly heavy ions medical accelerators was built. It's located at Tochiba, uh, very close to the Tokyo city. And uh, <clears throat> just yesterday, I checked the total number of the patients. So already more than 29,000 patients was treat, were treated by this heavy ion cancer therapy, heavy, heavy ion beams. Now in Japan, it's, it's really popular. Not only this accelerators, we have several accelerators all at, at many places in Japan right now. But they are treated only in daytime. Then for instance, just by irradiating these heavy ions, you can treat uh, cancers, in this case, behind the eyes. Then otherwise, it's very difficult to do the operations by using the knife and blah, blah, blah. But just by irradiating, it's, 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 they are really recovered. But the key point of this ion therapy is blood peak. So when the velocity of ion is so high, almost no interaction in the sense of atomic collisions. But when the ion energy is reduced close to the binding energy of the molecules or atoms, suddenly they started to drop their energies, especially at the site of the cancers. That's really the big advantage of this ion beam therapy. But for us, we know very well, <clears throat> radiation damage. Radiation damage is caused by the nuclear interaction. In this case, it's, I should say elastic scattering or electronic contribution means the inelastic scattering in the particle range in the energy less than 10 MeV. But what's happened at the energy of 10 GeV? 10 GeV, 10 GeV is usually not for atomic physics. It's for nuclear physics. That means almost transparent, almost, I, sh I do not say nothing, but uh, negligible interactions in the sense of the atomic physics. That's a situation of the heavy ion interaction with the materials. And my material is crystal. So using this crystal, this crystal, this crystal is not a target this crystal for me. Is it's really the virtual photon source and it's uh, spectrometers. Then I will explain later, it's a really source of the very strong electric field. Okay. I'm sorry. So now, I, I'm always showing these cartoons. Now you can see the crystal, and you can see the boys, and the boy traveling through this crystal. You can see the array of the atom approaching to you. This is everything about uh, my physics. Ordinary photon absorption, of course, photon energy is just much to, is just equal to the interval of the energy level of the atomic state, atomic internal energies, photon will be absorbed. That's ordinary photon absorption. However, please consider ions 
just moving in the periodic potentials. Then if you sit on uh, ions like a boy, you can see the oscillating electric field. Then again, the frequency of this electric field, oscillating electric field, match to the transition energies, ion will be excited. So the formula to satisfy such condition is energy is equal to H multiplied by velocity divided by distance. Okay, very simple formula. This one. And more strictly speaking, such distance, we usually use the concept of the wave numbers. So one over lattice constant, K. Then we explain such potential as the sum of the Fourier series. And in three dimensional cases, of course, this K is no more scalar. We usually use a reciprocal vector, G. It's really three dimensional vector. And again, but again, we just uh, written this potential as a sum of these Fourier component. That's all, that's the same. And derivative of this, oh, spelling is not, this is tip of sp uh, derivative of the periodic potential is, derivative of potential is uh, electric field. So this is electric field. And we really need a Lorentz transformation into the projectile flame. Then we get the temporary oscillating field like this way. So green area shows the frequencies and the red zone shows the direction of the polarization. And the typical intensity of this field is a 10 to 11 volt per meter. So it's quite huge. It's 10 to, it's more as a 10 to 15 watt per square centimeters. So it's really the region of the intense laser. But today I want to say more in detail. Usually I skip this type of the slide because people hate equations. But today I will show. This is just simply Hamiltonian is some of the stationary Hamiltonian plus time dependent crystal periodic potential. So it's again the same perturbation. Then just by calculating, finally we can get to these equations for the transition probabilities. Green areas, reciprocal vector G and uh, are we, we calculate the inner product. Originally, to tell the truth, we couldn't understand what it means. It's just a phase. And so we couldn't understand the meaning of these terms. But later on, if we can write the wave function of the ions by the plane wave, like electrons, then this term is equivalent to the Bragg diffraction conditions. Later on, I will explain. Then red area is, uh, again, it's uh, really resonance conditions. Energy equal uh, to H nu. Okay? Then <clears throat> such simple ideas originally predicted by the Russian scientist, Okolokov, Professor Okolokov, and it's really confirmed experimentally by Sheldon Dance, so long, long day before. And also the Japanese scientist, the cellist, also Professor Kondo, famous as the Kondo effect, he's a solid state physicist, but again, he also predicted such phenomena. But I want to repeat again, the frequencies of this phenomena. We use the very high energy ions, the velocity 
of the ion is close to the speed of light, then as a span, if we use a crystal, typical length is the order of Ongström. Then typical frequency is 10 to 18 hertz. It's a really region of the X-ray. Okay. Then physics is very simple. So this means just by accelerating the, just by increasing the velocity of the ions, we can excite everything in principle. Then this is a history of the, this resonant coherent excitation research. So spending more than 30 years, 40 years, energy is started from the very low energy, then it's going to the several hundred MeV per nucleons. The total energy is went up to the 10 or 20 GeV. Why? Why we need high energies? Of course, just by using the high energy ions, we can excite the higher transition energy. So we can enjoy the physics with the heavy ions. But not only that, as I already explained to you, we can suppress ordinary atomic collision processes. So in this energies, ion is almost can pass through the crystal without any other perturbations or negligible perturbations. For ions, crystal looks like a transparent material. That's the reason. Then because of that, resonance with is getting narrower and then narrower and narrower because of the good coherency. Then recently, we moved to the Germany to enjoy the physics with the uranium ions. Now we already succeeded to excite the ex electronic excitation of the lithium-like uh, uraniums. And so in such ways, we can, I should say, we can excite almost everything, a, all atomic state. Okay, then let's start with uh, one-dimensional and two-dimensional RCEs. I already explained to you that periodic periodicity is important. Then originally people consider periodicities due to the array of the atomic atoms like this. So I should say this is a one-dimensional RC. Then the first experiment done by Sheldon that he exactly changed ion energy to fit the resonance condition. But later on, people noticed under the planar channeling condition. Under the planar channeling condition means ions, if he travels parallel to the crystal plane, not crystal stream, then ion has a chance to feel the periodicities due to the strings, array of the atomic strings. So in these pictures, you can see the blue array or red arrays. Ion feels the periodicities due to these arrays, then we'll be excited. In this case, just by changing the angles between the crystals and ions, you can change the periodicities. It's like a Venetian blind. So you don't need to change the energy of the ion. So experimentally, that's a huge, big advantage. Just by changing the angle of the crystal, you can do the resonance condition, okay? Then suppose hydrogen-like ions. If we excite one s ground state electron, to n equal two, 
by this resonant coherent excitation, simultaneously, of course, the excitation takes place. But not only that, ionizations by the collision with the atom in a crystal take place. Of course, I already emphasized such process is really reduced, but nevertheless, it's really take place. And of course, ordinary X-ray, the excitation, X-ray emission is, take, is really take place. So by detecting ionization process or X-ray emission process, we can confirm such process really occurs. And to measure such phenomena experimentally, in, in this way, we observed the X-ray using the semiconductor detectors, or sometimes we measure the charge state just by putting the magnet behind the crystal, then putting the two-dimensional detectors, we scan the charge state of the ions passing through the crystal. And this is a picture of the experimental setup. So it's not a large scale experiment, but not, not so small. Okay, then let's consider again, hydrogen like argon cases. Let's excite from the one S to two P state. Then this is a picture of the, our first experiment. X-axis is uh, just a tilting angles of the crystal with respect to the ion beam. So we tilted the crystal. Then we monitor the fraction of the hydrogen-like algorithms. So if resonance occurs, it's excited to the N equals two state, then N equals two state electron are more easily stripped off. So that means uh, survival fluxion will decrease. And indeed, we could find many, many, many resonance quite easily. Then if you enlarge one spectrum, surely we observe the fine structures, 2p half and 2p3 half. So our resolution is enough to identify such, such structures. But not only that, immediately you can see strange profile. You can see the dip in the left peak and it's really not symmetric, it's really skewed structures. Very strange. But the answer is huge DC static electric field in a crystal. So it suffered from the Stark effect. Then this Stark effect really depends on the strength of the electric field and the electric field depends on the ion position in a crystal. If it is in the center between a crystal plane, nothing at all. But when ion approach to the crystal plane, it's getting huge. And from such point of view, now I just copied the very old textbook of the Hans Bate handbook, their physics. And if LS interaction in the stock effect is in the same orders, we should observe such four levels. And because of this stock effect, the wave function of the each levels must change drastically in such way. It's really in a very complicated manner. And the wave function, for instance, the red spot is the spot of the level crossing areas. At this point, the content of the wave function drastically changes. That's what I already told you. But how 
can we learn such strange behavior experimentally? To know the ion position in a crystal, we need something to observe. Then we decided to observe the energy loss of the ions. Energy loss is directly related to the ion trajectories. In this case, red trajectory corresponding to the smaller energy loss because it travels in the center of the crystal plane with less electron density. And the green case is a really larger energy loss. So just by measuring the energy loss, we can learn about the ion trajectories. Then we already know that, okay, for instance, this is a typical cases under the channeling conditions total energy will become almost half. Total loss, energy loss will be the almost half. But to measure the energy loss of such 10 GeV electron, 10 GeV ions, that's not so easy. But we, we had very nice, good ideas. We decided to use target just as a detector. As I already explained you, our target is uh, silicon. So we can use uh, silicon detectors for target because it's a very silicon crystal. And simultaneously, we can get the signal, output signal of the silicon surface detectors. It's really proportional to the, uh, no, it's, it's really deeply related with the ion trajectory. Okay, then this is the result. So now the x-axis is a tilt angle of the crystal, but it's really corresponding to the transition energies. And the y-axis is corresponding to the energy loss. And this contour is very beautiful two-dimensional picture. Yes, this is exactly the same as explained by the theoretically. But I want to point out that now electric field is extremely high. It's artificially almost impossible. But uh, in reality, in crystal, we have a huge electric field. Then now we can observe such uh, stark effect behaviors very clearly. Okay. Then we also try not only to the stark effect into the n equal two state, but n equal three state, n equal four state. Yes, <clears throat> we succeeded to observe such stark effect behaviors very clearly. Another trials we did later on is uh, we decided to put the uh, aluminum foil stripper just after the silicon crystals. Yes, now we know because of the stark effect, we can make the mixture of the 2S and 2P state. As you know very well, 2P state is forbidden state and so the lifetime of the excited state is so long, so it can travel a lot. But the 2P state, lifetime is so short, so it dies immediately after excitations. But just by putting the strippers, we can strip electron of the 2S state. So just by putting the strippers, and uh, if we just to check the difference between the condition of the stripper in and the stripper out, we can learn how many 2P states, no, 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 2S state are extracted from the crystal. And this means by using this technique, we could prepare the metastable 2S excited ion beam artificially. It's, you know, sometimes, you know, the penning ionization, it's very easy to prepare the helium 2S state beam, but even with uh, heavy ions, we can prepare the 2S excited beam in such way. And this is a theoretical calculation 
the obtained by the collaboration with a Russian group, and it's really agreed with the theoretical result. Then after that, we put the, decided to use a very thin crystal because very thin crystal cases, the ion trajectory, we can measure very uniquely just by the position sensitive detectors. So measuring the two dimensional at uh, position of the ion trajectory, again, we can learn the ion trajectory inside the crystal. That's a starting point of the, to use a very thin crystals. I already, just as I already explained you. Then we measured <clears throat> such beautiful signals. However, that's not the end. Okay, <clears throat> then I want to move the three dimensional R sheets using the very thin crystal. Then the next person, she was at that time very young student at the master course. And I requested her to measure the X-ray emitted under the channeling conditions. And usually under the channeling conditions, collision phenomena is reduced. So always the X-ray yield should be re reduced if it is not in a resonance conditions. And indeed, we observe such dip. However, I requested her to measure the background at the off-channeling condition. But she found very strange behaviors. So suddenly increase and decrease and they have a very, very strange behaviors. And at the very beginning, we couldn't understand at all. And for instance, she believed something was wrong. Detector may be destroyed, or she made a mistake. But that's not true. It's really physics. The answer of this physics is this three-dimensional large. Even under non-channeling condition, Ion can feel the periodicities originated from the crystal plane always. And in such conditions, of course, ion has many chance to collide with the crystal plane. Then usually because of such collision, coherence will be lost. But to avoid such coherence loss, we need a very high energy ion beam energies. Then for instance, to observe hydrogen-like ions because of these reasons, we need a very thin crystal. Otherwise, all of the electrons are stripped off immediately but using very thin crystal and very high energy ions, we can avoid such difficulties. Then this is a typical result of the scan as a function of the again tilted angles. So we observe many, many, many dips because of such resonance. And the, these dips, these enhancement is because of the channeling. So it's really the mixture of channeling and uh, resonance. It's very complicated. However, <clears throat> after that, <clears throat> uh, after we've, we've, we found such phenomena, we discovered this very important statement by Crawford and Riches. So to observe the such resonant coherent excitations, they predict Channeling is not a necessary requirement for resonant coherent excitation. A long coherent time is necessary for sharp resonance. Coherent times increase with the increasing velocity and the increasing atomic numbers. Exactly, this is what we did. 
we rediscovered this, re -disc uh, this sentence later. But anyway, now to satisfy the resonance conditions, we have many parameters. Not only changing the velocity of the ions, we have two parameters to change the angle of the crystal, theta and phi. That's very important. Then another point I want to stress is, again, I going back, I, I came back to the, this uh, equation of the electric field. And this means polarization is really uniquely defined. So this means it's really linearly polarized light. And at the same time, I should say it's a multicolor light. So simultaneously, I, I can feel the many, many variety of the periodicities. So this strange light is a multicolor light and linearly polarized light. Then, this ions has no trajectory dependence because ions simply passing through the array of the crystal plane. So it's really written by the plane wave, even though this is ions. It's really quantum mechanically described by the plane wave. If we say about the coherence, of course, people know it's inelastic ion diffraction. Can we observe diffraction of the high energy heavy ions? Okay, usually diffraction is a really the quantum physics. And in this case, velocity of the ion is so high and the double wavelength is so small. 10 to 17 millimeters. So this means that considering the crystal velocity of the order of 10 to 10, millimeter, 10 meters, then the diffraction angle is only 10 to minus seven radians. So surely it's impossible experimentally to detect. However, this phenomenon is indeed inelastic ion diffraction with internal excitations, with momentum transfer written by Hg. I will explain again later on. And yes, these equations I already explained to you. Gr is uh, explained by, it's really showing the black diffraction condition. Anyway, okay, let's consider again about the resonance condition for under this three-dimensional resonance. In this case, we have two parameters, theta and phi, to rotate the crystal. Then the condition of the spot on all of, all of these lines satisfy the resonance condition. That's Surprising. So almost always, ion will be excited if ion velocity is so high. Surprising, but that's true. So now I should say it's very difficult to avoid such resonance. And on purpose, we try to scan such resonance. Okay, this is a one of the enlarged area of the previous this mapping. First, we observe the flammar channeling under the condition of the phi equals zero. Then we scan again the red line, and we scan these lines, these lines, then as predicted by theories, we could observe such resonance. Then even for the helium like case, yes, we observed such resonance very clearly. Then also about the polarization. To measure the polarization, we observe the angular distribution of the 
emitted X-rays. So for this purpose, we put the two detectors on the vertical and the horizontal positions. So this is a picture of the experimental setups. Then if we excite ions in, in such a way written in these pictures, then vertical detectors detect more, more X-rays than horizontal detectors. But if ions are excited in such a way, intensity ratio is reversed and so on. So this means using this technique, we can control the polarization of the excited state of the heavy ions. Of course, using the ordinary lasers, visible lasers, it's very easy to control the polarization of the alkaline atoms. But for heavy atom, it's almost impossible, but we can. And another big topic is Stark loading. 10 minutes before, I stressed ion field, a huge static electric field. Because of that, static broadening is really the big effect because of such strong electric field. But the three-dimensional analysis, there's no such static effect at all. At the very beginning, it was surprising and we considered for many months, really not for several weeks. We spent more than two months. Why? Stark broadening, we do not, we didn't observe. The answer is like that. For resonance, we applied the AC field. Yes, this is a crystal field. And in addition, DC field is applied for the channeling cases, two-dimensional LCs. But for three-dimensional LC cases, perturbation is again AC field. So we should consider not the DC stroke effect, but the second order AC stroke effect. Then just by calculating the effect of this AC stroke effect, we realize that's really negligible small. That's the answers. But uh, this is just, this is not just answers. It's a really starting point of the next step. Static DC field cases, DC stroke effect, and oscillating AC field cases, AC stroke effect. And if the frequency of this AC field is not equal to the other excitation frequencies, but frequency of the another excite, frequency of the AC stark effect is just equal to the another excitation frequencies. Then it's really equal to the double resonance. Okay, so double resonance is really the key point for the controlling of the quantum state or yes, pump and probe type experiment. So using our technique, we realize that we can enjoy the double resonance, okay? So now I already spend uh, almost 50 minutes. So I skip this topic already. This may be too much. This is interesting, but I'm sorry. I want to skip this topic. Double resonance, <clears throat> two. So at that stage, we welcome the new researchers, Dr. Hatakeyama. He came from the Kyoto universities and he majored in the quantum optics. Then from the viewpoint of the quantum optics, for him, this crystal is a two different electric fields. Under the same configurations, ion can feel the two different electric fields. Using this two electron field, it's really just like the two type of the two, two different energy level of the XF here. 
if you can use these two photons, sometimes you can enjoy the pump and probe experiment using UVU lasers and X-ray FEL. Yes. But uh, if we see, consider this experiment from the bare atomic pictures, one is, for instance, one S two S state is a forbidden state, but using two photons, we can transfer the electron into this into this forbidden state by double resonance. But if we use the concept of the dressed atom, as I already explained at the very beginning of this talk, using one photons, we can cup. 2s and 2p state. Then such coupled state we probe using the another photons. That's a, the same physics but using the different pictures. Or from the viewpoint of the diffractions, sometimes people can excite a forbidden state using the successive two diffractions. That's really dynamic diffractions. Different viewpoint of physics, but the same phenomena. Then to observe such phenomena, as I already explained to you, we change two different to degree of the rotation angles. So this is equal, equivalent to use the two wavelengths tunable lasers. Then we observe the ionization processes. First, if single resonance is satisfied, yes, as usual, we observe again a dip, but two double resonance condition is satisfied. We observe the very strange profile. Then, we decided to put again a strip of oil to extract two estate, as already explained to you. Then we clearly observe the double state under the double resonance condition. What is this double? So we change the frequency of the probe light or coupling light by changing the crystal angles. We monitor, we check the, how the, this profile changed. And it's really drastically changed in this way. In photon cases, dressed atom is uh, atom are dressed by the photons and divided into two states. But our cases, we really do not have uh, real photons but it's really dressed by the crystal. Instead of the photons, we transfer the momentum of the pi g, not h nu, but the, the same equations. Because of that, just by changing the two parameters, again, we observed such avoided level crossing behaviors. We are so happy to observe this phenomenon. Then <clears throat> from this behaviors, we estimated the lobby frequencies close to 10 to 15 hertz. So it's a really femtosecond physics. And it's a really region of the intense laser. Yes, I will repeat these pictures again. So the finally, I will say atom light interaction is well understood but to our physics is really through the crystal. We really exchange the atomic inner state energies and atomic translational motions. So to be excited, I don't lose energies or momentum a little bit. Then equation, two equations, almost the same or exactly the same. And finally, such coupled state. In this case, we coupled the 2s and the 2p x state using the linearly polarized. 
And uh, we decided to observe again a polarization by observing the X-rays. If polarization the probe and the coupled photons are orthogonal, no doublet at all. But if it is close to parallel, indeed we observe the doublet. So we confirmed we really understand the physics correctly. So this is the final cartoon. Now simply using the crystal, we succeeded to prepare such dressed state. Then always, even without X-ray lasers, ion with high energy traveling through the crystal, enjoying such oscillations. So now this is a summary of my talk. So using such technique, we can coherently control the level of population of the high energy ions in X-ray regions. However, the, or additionally, the summary too is, science often find a deep relationship between events that are at a glance seemingly unrelated. So now I hope you understand my, this channeling or non-channeling phenomena is not peculiar, not strange. This is very unique common physics we found. Okay, then finally, three key points for the success of the observations. We should meet three different types of the collaborators. Okay, thank you very much. My talk was too long, but anyway, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, okay. Professor Azuma, for this uh, nice talk. And uh, now it's open for discussion Hello. and questions. We can probably take a couple of uh, these, uh, if somebody has. Uh, so either you can ask it or just write it in the chat box, and then uh, we can take it up one by one. <coughs> Hello. Hare. Nobody here? Uh, so, so far... Uh, Okay, uh, so maybe I can ask one and then probably somebody uh, will have another one. Yeah, sure, so, sure. Um, so you mentioned this uh, um, uh, transition into a uh, 2P state and 2S state, right? Well, the ion is passing through the crystal. Mm -hmm. And then by putting a stripper foil, uh, mm -hmm. one could actually find out the, uh, the contribution from 2S metastable state ions. Right. Right. So, uh, so my question is, uh, I mean, so that's actually a destructive method of finding the contribution, right? Because then we are actually losing ions which are uh, in 2S state. Yes, because right. the lifetime 2S is, as you know, is a very short. Right. It immediately right. dies. Right. But only the 2S component survives. Right. In, the, in the realistic length. Okay. 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 So, okay. So, so basically, the stripper foil helps us also in filtering out these uh, ions uh, into a state. Because exactly. they will survive and the 2B ones will. Uh, exactly. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Okay. exactly. Okay. To confirm the only the 2 S state are traveling. Right. So, I should say we could prepare the metastable mm -hmm. ion. Right. right. There's a, there's a question. Yeah, uh, there's a question from David Joseph. Uh, mm -hmm. So his question is, kindly tell how Rabi oscillations work. Uh, I mean, it's a basic mechanism. What do you mean a basic mechanism? <laughs> <laughs> uh, David, you want to ask it? <laughs> yeah, the, the point of the Rabi oscillation is really there from the glance from the 2S state to 2P state. So they are really going up and down and up and down very frequently with a period of the femtosecond. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if coherency is not high, ion sometimes going up and down, that's all. But if coherency is so high, it's repeat up and down and up and down. Do you understand? So it's really there. It's really there. 
Rabi oscillation is between 2S and 2P state. Finally, I showed a cartoon of the wave function changes. It's really between a 2S and 2P. Okay? Yeah, it's just time. It's just time. Uh, maybe I can yeah, ask sure. Thomas and you saw the polarization of the X rays, right? So did you really measure the polarization of the X rays? Yes. Okay. yes. So is yes. it at the GSI experiment because they have a polarization measurement? Uh... Exactly. Yes. Yes. Okay. But uh, now I will tell you the secret story. <laughs> very up, very up, very up, updated very story. Updated story. Mm -hmm. Using the high mark. Using the high mark. Just by yeah. observing the anisotropy of the angular distribution of the X-ray, we mm -hmm. could say about the polarization. Mm -hmm. But yes, we yes. have the special detectors, one detector to detect the polarization, like a GSI. Mm, right. We can say the same physics, but very recently we introduced a really advanced such detectors for polarization. Again, this collaboration with astrophysicists. Then now we can measure the polarization using the one detector. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mm, hello, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, uh, although it's a very, um, yeah, I don't know if it will be right, but uh, as you said that um, HCE, can it be, can it be, it's my, um, well, it can be a vague question, but uh, can it be used in many body physics, particularly in case, case of uh, plasmas? What do you mean uh, many body interaction in plasmas? Uh, many body please, interaction. Please, please. Please uh, consider it's, it's, my, my uh, technique is almost the same as uh, X-ray photon. Okay. So it um, if it uh, if it can be extended to the point that uh, while uh, we see in the plasma there is also a polarization. Uh, okay. Okay. Now I understand your point. <clears throat> okay. In plasmas, sometimes ions are really polarized. Yes. Yes. Then to measure polarization, you can use this technique. In such way, in principle, you are right. But that's not a many body physics. It's really yeah, simply, because... simply we measure the polarization over the up, single atom in plasma. Yes. Okay, thank you. So, I think if there are no more questions, then uh, on behalf of the society, let me first thank Professor Azuma once again for uh, accepting our invitation and giving this uh, a nice colloquium. Right? And I would also like to thank all the audience members for staying with us uh, and joining us today. Uh, the next colloquium uh, uh, of the society will be on 23rd of October and uh, our speaker is uh, uh, Professor Alexander Dawn from MPI Heidelberg. So uh -huh. I hope uh, you can uh, join us there. Uh, the details of it will be sent to you uh, soon. Right. So uh, with that, uh, thank you all once again. Thank you, yeah. thank you Professor Azuma for sure. Yeah. All, of, really all really of life can be explained by avoided crossings. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Thank you're you. welcome. <laughs>